Welcome to the Baltic University and the second session on our course, the Baltic Sea Environment. This time we will talk about the biology and the ecology of the Baltic Sea. Our main guide will be Lena Kowski, who is here and who is a professor of marine botany at Stockholm University. We also have Nils Kautsky, who is a professor of marine ecotoxicology at Stockholm University. And uh, Lena and Nils are married to answer any questions. And then we have two guests from neighboring countries. These are uh, Dr. Evald Ojaver from Estonian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Ojaver Evald is a um, expert on fish and fishing in the Baltic Sea. Welcome. He is also a director of the uh, Institute of Ecology and Marine Research in Tallinn. And we also have Dr. Paula Lindros from the Obo Academy University in Obo, Turku. Uh, Paula has been researching parasites on fish, but she is now working on extensive education for the general public and also people uh, doing fish farming. We'll come back to that. We are right now in a small museum, very close to the Stockholm University main campus. Um, Stockholm University has a long tradition in marine research and research on the Baltic Sea. And in fact, uh, they have also f f formed a special center for uh, such research, Nils. Yes, we have the Stockholm Center for Marine Research. And uh, that's sort of an umbrella organization for marine researchers at the university. And uh, we have geologists, we have uh, botanists, meteorologists, zoologists, systems ecologists, marine chemists, and a lot of various disciplines within this center. And uh, the center encourages interdisciplinary research between mm. all these uh, scientists, sciences. And uh, also the center has uh, sort of a responsibility for environmental monitoring from the Åland Sea and down to the Danish sounds. And of course the center also is involved with uh, research out in the field. And Stockholm University for this purpose has two field stations quite well known by the, f by the way. The, the first one is at Aske. Uh, the Aske laboratory is uh, south of Stockholm, just in the uh, northern part of the Baltic proper. And I believe you can say something about that, Nils? Yes. Mm. Here at Aske we have been carrying out research on the Baltic Sea for about 30 years now. And uh, this is still a rather unpolluted area of the Baltic. And this station is just now rebuilt and uh, modernized and enlarged. Mm. And they also have a uh, center on the west coast, Lena. Yes, and uh, we mainly have field courses. And this is the Kjernan Marine Biology Lab. And at this field course station, we uh, try to learn out what about the Kattegat environment. And that we need to do because it's more easy to understand how uh, the Baltic works when you have seen what Kattegat looks like. So what would you say now when you have experience from the both sides, on the Atlantic side and the Baltic side, what are the main differences? Yes, I think the main differences are the salinity and uh, the differences are really enormous. And uh, this large salinity differences, I think we best show by uh, going on for a small tour at the Kattegat coast. So this is Kullaberg. It's on the west coast of Sweden, just in the northern part of Öresund. You see it's a very rocky coast here. And uh, we will use this to illustrate what the typical marine environment looks like. If we go below the surface here, what do we see, Lena? Yes, the first we meet a lot of different algae species in a very, very colorful environment. You can see red and brown filamentous algae in this shallow area and um, they totally dominate the system. So there are small fishes swimming around too, and these are uh, lip fishes. When you go further down, you will see a more uniform environment with lots of red algae and some smaller animals on the rocks. Mm. These are red algae and a small cave you can see with two small fishes trying to hide a little bit, I think. 
What depth is this about? I would say something area? like 10 meters or so. Mm -hmm. This is a very colorful red, red algae and the divers are now about 50 meters perhaps. There are still some big algae and lots and lots of small colorful fishes. And here you can see a big brown algae also covered with small colony forming white hydrids. They mm -hmm. are animals. And this is filled up with life forms every square yes, centimeter more or less. It's totally covered with animals and small, small algae or big algae. And it's very, very variable. Mm -hmm. This is the tropical forest of the, uh, yeah, of the yes, seas. Yes, I eh? would say something like that. And uh, further down, there are less algae and more animals dominating. These are mussels and uh, several types of what, different colors on sea stars covering the rocks. And here mm -hmm. you have a sea rose next to a sea star. And here it's a very nice one. It's filtering particles, living on small particles. Mm -hmm. And the sea urchin that's grazing on the rocks. And two sea stars again, slowly, I think, trying to find a mussel perhaps to eat. Mm -hmm. They're moving very slowly over the rocks. And now the divers are rather deep down. There are only animals living here. And this is a sea rose. You can imagine why they get that name. Yes. Red and brown and white. They're all different types of colors on, on this. So those who believe that these things are found only in the tropical waters, they were wrong. Yes. These uh, are found also close to our, our own uh, yes. Diving, in our own waters. Diving mm. is really a fantastic experience. You should try it. I yes, think. I will try one day, yes. <laughs> now, uh, let's go over to the Baltic side, to the, uh, to the coast close to Finland, actually. And we will see for ourselves again what it looks like there. This is a contribution from Helsinki University. Biological diversity in the northern Baltic Sea is low, if compared to the oceans of the world. However, there are some rich animal and plant populations in the Baltic. The high numbers of individuals indicating that the animals are well adapted to local conditions. In the winter, the northern Baltic Sea have an Arctic atmosphere. Winter is long and cold. These landscapes filled with ice and snow, reflect also the biogeographical history of the sea. Its first inhabitants immigrated here in the end of the Ice Age, more than 10,000 years ago. In southwestern Finland, the coastal waters will be covered by ice every year, and organisms living in the sea confront many kinds of adaptational problems. The water temperature decreased to point zero, and when the ice is covered by snow, the light penetration will be mostly pre prevented. Consequently, all the biological activities are, are slow, and primary production is negligible. Near the mainland also the freshwater outflow accumulates under the ice and marine plants and animals are in danger of osmotic shock caused by diluted brackish water. Here they meet the limits of their adaptability and distribution. Also scientists studying the Baltic Sea are working in the harsh and icy world in the winter time. However, diving under the ice is always a fascinating experience. It is also dangerous and good training and security arrangements are necessary. Because of the drastic seasonal fluctuations of the physical environment, it is highly important to investigate how the Baltic organisms have adapted to live in the cold, brackish water. The cold, or rather the ice, which was very strongly stressed in this uh, contribution from Helsinki, is one problem, of course, for living 
organisms in the Baltic. But I think that the low salinity is even a more problem. And uh, the salinity you can see decreases very sharply when you go from Kattegat out through the Danish sounds. We have something about 10 per mil up to the Baltic proper 7 per mil and up to Botnian Bay around 3 or almost freshwater conditions. Uh, on the next uh, picture, we can see the evolution of salinity during the time. And um, this has changed very drastically. And you can see that it has passed from lake conditions uh, over to uh, Jolia Lake to uh, Anselus Lake and back again to uh, marine environment. And just now we have for something like 3,000 years, a rather short time, had a, a, a low brackish environment. This is a short time for evolutionary adaption. Very few uh, marine species have been able to adapt to this environment. And uh, on the map coming here, you can see that there are 1,500 species in the Kattegat and in the Baltic you will only have about 70 species. And uh, also with the lowered salinity species disappear and the starfish and the crabs, sea urchins, they disappear already just inside the Danish sounds. While some other species like blue mosses and bladder wreck, you will find them even north of the Åland Sea and they are more tolerant than the others. Now I know Nils that you have a favorite object here, the blue mussels, which is your research uh, object. And you brought some with you, I see. And uh, what, what about that? Okay, here they are. And, and uh, this is just to show you the difference in size between the North Sea mussels. They are, have this size, you can see here, and the Baltic mussels, which are much smaller. And uh, the reason for this difference is the salinity. And uh, that is because in the Baltic Sea, all organisms, and uh, especially the mussels, are under severe uh, osmotic stress. And that costs lots of energy to them. And that's why they can't grow any larger. Mm -hmm. Evald, what would you say is the main difference between the marine environment on in the Kattegat and uh, the situation in the Baltic Sea? Yes, the situation in fishes resembles that in invertebrates. Uh, if in the North Sea the species number of marine fishes is about 120, then say in the Gulf of Finland and Gulf of Botnia, the number of species of marine origin is about 20 only. In the Gulf of Finland, we cannot see the fishes very common in the Danish waters, say mackerel, then dab, place, and even cod is rare in some periods. Uh, if in the middle of 50s, cod disappeared from the Gulf of Finland, it reappeared only uh, in the end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. Quite like other fishes of marine origin have uh, problems in the Baltic Sea with reproduction because of it has floating eggs mm -hmm. and uh, because of low salinity in the Baltic Sea they sink into the uh, deeper layer where mm -hmm oxygen content is very small and uh, that prevents them to develop and uh, therefore uh, the survival rate is, can be very small. Mm -hmm. Therefore in some periods when uh, water exchange between the Baltic Sea and Kattegat is limited, a cod spawning grounds shrink and uh, they can be confined, cod spawning is confined only to the western and, and southern deep. So the marine species do have a problem with the brackish water, I understand. What about the sizes of yeah. these um, yeah. fishes? Are they this, the same size as herring, for example? What about average sizes of a herring in the Baltic Sea compared to the size of uh, the North Sea herring? 
Yes, that is another problem because of along with uh, declining salinity and increasing uh, severity of winters, uh, the size, the theoretical maximum size, say herring in the Gulf of Finland is about eight times less than uh, in the Arcona Basin. If in the Gulf of Finland the theoretical maximum weight of herring is about 35 grams, then in the Arcona Basin that uh, is about 230 grams. Mm. Paula, what would you say is the most characteristic, uh, from your point of view, for the Baltic compared to uh, the west coast of Sweden? I think uh, uh, very astonishing is that uh, in terms of, of fish catches, mm -hmm. the, the Baltic Sea is still very, very rich. Yes, it's one of the richest uh, mm -hmm. seas in the world, actually, yes. sea catch-wise. So even if there are fewer species and they are smaller, uh, individuals, uh, the biomass is still impressive. Uh, now, we will talk about the um, biology of the Baltic Sea in such a way that we will start by looking through all the various communities of plants and animals that uh, exist on the bottoms along the shores and on the bottoms of the Baltic Sea. There are quite a few distinct such communities, so this will take us about um, all the time up to the uh, musical intermission which we will have at uh, about 60 minutes or so. And then after this musical intermission we will go out in deep water so to speak, talk about what's in the water. We will talk a little or theoretical on deep waters, discuss fundamentals of ecology and we will uh, discuss the big animals ending up with ourselves of course, the men and the Baltic Sea so to speak. Um, so this is the schedule we have ahead of us, but now we'll start, start by talking about the various plant and animal communities and start at the shore itself, and the rocky shore we will start with. In the spring, when the ice cover is gone, an annual succession starts with the uh, diatom covering the bare rocks just around the waterline. And later on in the summertime, this is followed up with the green algae Cladophora glomerata, which you can see as a green belt along the shores. Uh, this is then later in the autumn uh, succeeded by the red algae Ceramium. The Cladophora belt usually starts developing in June and what you see here now in August is the second generation of Cladophora growing on these rocks. Uh, this belt is uh, very well developed in June, July and then all the plants uh, are detached from the rocks and they drift along to some shallow areas and then later on in August, uh, September, you will have a second or even a third generation of uh, Cladophora growing on, on these rocks, rocks in a very clear uh, zone. You mentioned that these uh, communities have a very clear change over the year. What, uh, can you sum up this, yes. which is, what does it look like I in will summer try and to, spring as to well? summarize it a little bit. And, um, there are several factors, starting uh, really with ice, and uh, I will show you a picture. Uh, you can see the ice cover, and then usually there is nothing below. It uh, goes over to diatoms, which are most of them cold water species, and then they and Pilagella are brown pigmented at rather low temperatures and still low lights in the water. In the summer, when there are lots of light, there are also lots of um, green algae, and when it gets darker in the autumn, the ceramium with the red pigment grows close to the shore, or can even uh, try to stay under the ice for some part of the year. Very good. We will keep track of this next mm. time we get out to the shore of the yes, Baltic. Yes, do that. <laughs> um, if we continue further down, below this uh, uh, shallow algal belt, we'll come into a zone with brown algae. Uh, it's dominated by a species called uh, Fucus, and this is a key species in the Baltic ecosystem, so we will study that a little more carefully. You know these annual plants or uh, algae, you find perennial algae 
And here in the Baltic, the main species is Fucus vesiculosus, the bladder rack. This species contains the most species-rich community in the whole Baltic, with something like 10 epiphytic uh, algae and uh, up to 30 animals living in Fucus communities. In this area out at Aske, we are studying the shallow populations of Fucus. And um, this is a very sheltered bay. And what you see here is uh, an area where we have marked the individual Fucus plants. And uh, we are measuring the growth of them individually and trying to uh, get to know how old a Fucus plant can get. And by that we are following each individual during several years and measuring the growth of them. What we will try to do now is to show you how to determine the age of a single Fucus plant. I will pick one here. To determine the age of a Fucus plant, you can look at the number of bladders produced. And this is done in the way that each year they produce a shoot and some bladders. And then you count them backwards. So this is the first year, the second year, the third year, so a very old bladder, four or five years old should this talus plant be. They also produce some other types of bladders and they look like this instead. And in this plant here I have no, almost no floating bladders, but lots of these receptacles. This is the, where the reproduction takes place and the whole branch is lost uh, after they have been reproducing. So ho this whole branch will uh, disappear, be turned off like that and they will only grow further on with these vegetative parts. And then we also have another way what happens to a, a Fucus plant and that you can see in this one. They have very funny looking tops with lots of shoots on them. Look at that. And um, these are the signs that they have been grazed or hurt in some way. And if you look at this part of the plant, you can see that they are grazed quite a lot. So there must be some grazers predating or grazing on, on the Fucus plant. And uh, if we shake one of these like this, then we can see some small muscles. These are the blue muscle. And you also see some small gamma reeds trying to hide. And these gamma reeds are uh, one of the main grazing animals on uh, the Fucus talus. There are also small snails. There is one, this small black dot, Theodoxus. And um, they mainly graze on the small filamentous algae on growing on the Fucus talus. This brown thing on top here is a small filamentous algae called Elakista. So you have lots of animals living in um, these Fucus plants and because of that they are the main feeding ground and foraging for lots of fishes who live in and nearby the Fucus uh, community and um, then graze on mussels, snails, gamma reeds and whatever they can find in the uh, Fucus talus. Uh, these contributions were from the Asker feed station in uh, the Swedish archipelago south of Stockholm. We will also see what it looks like uh, on the eastern side. We will go from the August, which uh, these shots were from August, to the winter. And that is from Tverminne, which is the field station of Helsinki University. Many plants, the bladderwrack of Hucus vesiculosus as an example, 
display considerable, considerable morphological and physiological variation. Plants from wave exposed open sea are without gas bladders and the algae are small in size, dense and slender. At sheltered habitats, Fukustalli are broader with large bladders. Professor George Russell from Liverpool University has for many years studied different aspects of adaptation of the Baltic Fucus population. Well, they have adapted in three ways, at least three ways. Uh, first of all, they have altered their physiology somewhat so that they are um, able to grow in water uh, with very low salt content. Secondly, they have altered and adjusted their reproductive cycle to meet the rather severe climatic and hydrological conditions you have here. And thirdly, they have changed somewhat their internal organization, their anatomy. I saw that you have brought two aquariums with you here, Niels. What, what are these, actually? Well, first again, I, I wanted to show you the very diverse communities from the North Sea. This aquarium is, is with North Sea species. You can see there are very many species in it, and lots of different ones. And when we look at the other aquarium, it's a sample from the Baltic Sea, and uh, really one of the most dominating species you find here is the bladderwrack, Fucus vesiculosus. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very important community in the Baltic, because it harbors about half of all the animal species you can find here. And uh, if I would use this aquarium as a crystal ball and look into the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can still see Fucus there, mm -hmm. I would be reassured as a scientist. But if Fucus would disappear and all the community with it, I would be really worried. Mm -hmm. What is the situation for the Fucus now? Is it uh, increasing or decreasing? Uh, the problem is that it has been decreasing on a long-term mm -hmm. trend. And mm -hmm. uh, it has also been fluctuating quite a lot and uh, there is some sort of imbalance in the sea and uh, it is pollution certainly is involved in, in this but there are also other factors because the direct effect on fucus could be also grazing from some of the animals in there but that mm. would mean that they are disturbed by, by some, some other factor. So but, are you able to say if it increases uh, on a general level or decreases? I think the scientists were extremely worried uh, some 10 years ago, but uh, where Fucus had disappeared then, it has now come back again. But mm -hmm. still we have the, the problem where we can see direct pollution effects in the industry outlets areas mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. where areas of eutrophication, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, well, what are the importance for the fish, do you say, on, uh, of Fucus? Yes, uh, the belt of bottom vegetation is very important indeed in uh, the life of fishes of the Baltic Sea. Firstly, a uh, very well-known fish, Baltic herring, spawns in this belt and uh, its eggs stick uh, on the bottom vegetation, including focus. The best substrate for, for spawn is uh, red and brown algae, including focus. And, uh, of course, there are quite a number of fish, including gobies, uh, snake, blenny and others, uh, and smaller freshwater fishes, which live all their life in uh, this focus belt. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is the food for larger fishes. So this is the hunting ground for uh, perch and pike and uh, what more have you? Uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. this belting uh, gave shelter to mm -hmm. invertebrates and smaller fish. Mm -hmm. Now we saw that Fucus is in the middle zone of the algal belt. 
And there is a very good explanation for that, and that we, we will see on the next contribution from Aarhus University in Denmark. Light is the energy source for algae. Their vertical distribution is strongly dependent on the quantity and quality of light penetrating the water. Light is absorbed in the water column by planktonic algae and by dissolved organic material. The amount of light decreases quickly with depth. Blue light penetrates furthest down, green light intermediate, red and yellow light are only found in the uppermost water column. The three principal types of microalgae are green, brown and red. They have different light absorbing pigments as adaptions to different light situations. Green algae are found above or in shallow water. Brown algae are found in shallow and deep water. Red algae are dominant in deep water and are also to be found at shallower depth, growing under other algae. So Lena, where do we find this algae? How far down do they actually go? Yes, I would say generally you would find them down to something like 20 meters depth. Mm -hmm. And at that depth uh, there is still 1% of the light penetrating down. Mm -hmm. And the simple way to measure it would be to measure with a Seki depth. So Seki was the favorite uh, expression last time we had yes. this course. Mm -hmm. And how much is Seki depth? You, you put down mm -hmm. this white plate and mm -hmm. you measure the double Seki disc. Uh, that, that would tell you how deep you would find the algae. Mm -hmm. What about uh, eutrophication? I mean, we learned last time that eutrophication will diminish the Seki depth. Mm. Does this have an effect on the algal belt around the Baltic? Yes, um, uh, we have seen quite a decrease in the Fucus depth distribution since the 40s. And mm. um, the main decrease is something like 3 meters. It mm. Earlier it grew down to something like 11 meters and now it's at 8 meters depth. Mm -hmm. We will go below the algal belt and uh, under the algal belt we only find different animal communities. So we'll, we will start by looking at that now. We have here a sample of a hard bottom from something like 15 meters just below and as you can see it's totally dominated by the blue mussel. The mussels live on small particles, phytoplankton and organic particles in the water. They are quite fantastic in the fa filtering capacity of these particles. So the whole uh, mats of blue mussel living in the Asker area are able to filter off the water once every three months. Particulate matter is thus consumed in the metabolic processes and inorganic salt excreted. After filling the nutrient demands of the macroalgae, the mutilus population can also furnish 5% of the nitrogen and 20% of the phosphorus needed to maintain the total phytoplankton biomass in the same area. In Kattegat, no single species dominates as in the Baltic. Deeper hard bottoms are covered with a multitude of animals and the blue mussel Mytilus edelis is restricted to areas with less predation. The main predators on the blue mussels are the British star Asterias rubens and the shore crab Carcinus menas, which have not been able to adapt to the low salinity in the Baltic proper. The low predation, together with few species competing for space on hard bottoms, have made it possible for the blue mussel to colonize large bottom areas in the Baltic. The small size of the mussels, which attain a mean adult size of only 30 mm, make them of little commercial value. They are, however, of great importance in enhancing the productivity of the total system being an important coupling between the hard bottoms and the pelagic zone in the Baltic. The blue mussels constitute the main food for some seabirds, such as the Eider duck, which has increased substantially in population during recent years in the Baltic. 
Hmm? Uh, Nils, we are back to your favorite animals here. What about the mussels? <laughs> yes. Uh, they, all these mats we saw, they were filled with mussels? Yes, mm -hmm. and you saw it was, was really a tremendous amount of mussels down there. And uh, in fact, they occupy most, most surfaces that are available in the Baltic Sea. And uh, there have been calculations that they, they make up about 70% of the total animal biomass in the Baltic of invertebrates. That's uh, enormous. And yeah. what, what is the reason for this enormous success, would you say? Well, the, the reason is is these animals again. I, I can show you here. It's the shore crab and uh, the st starfish, Asterias rubens. And both of them, they can't tolerate the low salinity in the Baltic and they disappear already just inside the Danish sounds. And uh, they are the main predators on mussels. And when they disappear and a lot of other competitors of the mussels disappear also, they, are, they can just spread out mm. over the bottoms. Mm. And now when they are so dominating, what role do they have in the Baltic ecosystems? Yeah, I think they, they have a, a tre tremendous role. And um, they eat plankton, they are, are filter feeders. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if you calculate this huge biomass of mussels, it can f turn over the, the total volume of the Baltic Sea in about one year. And uh, if you compare that to the, to the normal, the physical turnover time, which is 30 years, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite amazing. What about the uh, pollut pollutants in the Baltic Sea, in the water? Do we get rid of them when the uh, mussels filter this, the water? Uh, well, the, the mm -hmm. mussels are, are part of an ecosystem. Even mm -hmm. if they remove all uh, these uh, uh, plankton from the water, mm -hmm. they, they will still give back nutrients to the water. So mm -hmm. the whole cycle starts again. So, so mm -hmm. they are part of a cycle. But mm -hmm. of course they, they accumulate some, some toxins, mm -hmm. but not, not much more than other organisms in, mm -hmm. in the Baltic. Um, what, what about the, the fish and the mussels? I mean, if there's so much mussels, why don't the fish eat them? Or yes, uh, fish mm. eats mussels, of course, and mm. flatfish is uh, the most abundant group eating uh, mollusks, mm. including uh, mussels. Mm. And, of course, some other species, for instance, mm. sculpins. Mm. But still, uh, flatfish is far more abundant, mm. but uh, it has, like God, uh, problems with uh, reproduction in the Baltic Sea because of low salinity. Uh, therefore, Flatfish abundance decreases very seriously towards north and east. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, th there is more mussels than the flatfish ever can eat, I understand. Yeah, but what yeah. about men then? Don't we eat the mussels? No, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have enough on, on the Swedish. Did you, did you ever try them? I have tried them, mm -hmm. yes. You can eat them, but they, mm -hmm. they are so small. It's mm -hmm. so little flesh in them. Yeah. But uh, we, ha we have another species also eating mussels, and that's the eider duck. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and I think both flatfish and eider duck, they eat as much as they can, but uh, still they can't eat more than about a maximum of 1% of the mussel production per year. So mm -hmm. it has no impact at all on the mussels. Thank you. Now we will continue on the eastern shores of the Baltic. And that's uh, more typical, uh, the more typical um, beaches there are the sand beaches. Uh, this video from Poland, it was shot by a uh, team from Lund, made a video in Lund. You see the, some storches, it's close to Stetsin area. Here we see the sand beaches, so typical for Poland, for all the way up to Estonia actually and down through Germany and Denmark. What about, what about this um, sand bottom here, Nils? Uh, I think you, you quickly could see a dead fish down there. That's nothing typical for the Baltic. There is a lots of life there also. But uh, here you can now see lots of drifting algae. There are very few algae and uh, attached organisms on the sandy bottoms. And that's because they, they can't hold themselves there. It's too much wave action. Here you can see a, a diver, and uh, he was collecting some algae down there. Yes. But these are, are very typical coastlines along, on, along mm. the eastern, southeastern coast. What time of the year was this, uh, sh this shot with so much free-floating algae? Uh, I would say it was late summer or, or summertime. It mm. was the spring 
uh, algal bloom. With, with th these algae, which you could see there, had been growing on, on hard substrates, rocky shores mm. and, and pilings and, mm. and such things. But not on the sandy bottoms? Not on the sandy bottoms, no. No. We will continue from the sandy bottoms to the soft bottoms. And we will start that by going to the Swedish coast again and see what it looks like at the Askö area. The largest part of the seafloor is covered with muddy and sandy sediments. And in this shallow bay is a very loose sediment. And um, here all around the reed is covering a lot of the area. This together with other macrophytes are very common in these shallow areas. So it's a mixture of freshwater and marine species. And a typical marine species just floating around now is uh, Cordaphilum, a brown algae, which dies off at this time of the year and drifts to the shore in large quantities. These are usually growing on small stones sitting on, on uh, the stones in the bottom, in the soft areas. So you find that and you also find some drifting plants of Fucus vesiculosus, the brown ladder rack. Together with this you also find several animals from both the marine and the fresh environment. And they are some snails, some uh, fishes, uh, and also some dragonflies, insects, larvae, uh, which are typical freshwater species, but which are able to cope with the low salinity in, in these shallow areas. In shallow soft bottoms, without any macrophytes growing, you can we might still find some primary production. And this is in the uppermost centimeter of the sediment. And there are small algae growing in between the sand particles and organic particles in this upper centimeter. This you can show by a, a small experiment. by adding acetone to the sediment. And in this way, you will extract the chlorophyll content of these small uh, algae and the chlorophyll will get green, green color. In these shallow soft bottom areas, most of the animals are hiding or uh, getting shelter in, in the soft bottom and uh, try to find some of them. In this sample we find two types of mussels, the very common Macoma Baltica, there are lots of them, and we also found a few cardium. This is a typical species for the, the Baltic Sea, and this you also find on the uh, North Atlantic Kattegat coast, but then they are much bigger. And then you also find uh, some small polychies and some insects larvae, marine species and the freshwater. And the same is also true for lots of the macrophytes which I said earlier. And one typical marine species is Sostra marina. They get very small here in, in, in the Baltic and they don't grow that big as they do on the North Sea coast. But we still find them. They are never uh, reproductive here and you find lots of different uh, freshwater species like this for example uh, it's 
Myrifyllum spicatum and it grows very nicely in brackish base. It's sometimes a, a problem for both people when they grow too much they get into the, the motors and the motor gets stuck. And we also have a very specific form of uh, Fucus vesiculosus, which is uh, growing on these soft bottoms. It's a very small form, it's never reproductive and it's loose lying on, on the soft bottoms. So this is very very specific for, for the Baltic area, shallow area. And finally we have uh, marine species again, not very much to look at. Uh, it's Rupia spiralis or Rupia cirrhosa, also common on these uh, shallow soft bottoms, covering it sometimes as a small mat. Now we're actually sitting at a small reed bay that has been arranged at the museum here, and these reed bays typically have soft muddy bottoms. What are the main factors that decide, that decide what the life will be like in these bottoms here now? Yes. The, that's the mm. wave, the wave action and the currents mainly. Uh, with strong wave action and currents, all the uh, very loose lying organic matter is transported away and mm. you will have the uh, larger particles, sandy particles and, and so um, deposited. And mm. the, all the small fine particles you will find in the shallow uh, areas and there you have the really, really soft bottoms. Mm. And if we say these are the soft bottoms, uh, what are the conditions for uh, the animals living in it? Yes, they can have lots mm. of trouble with oxygen. Um, there mm. are much of organic matter in the sediment, so there will be anoxic uh, sediments very easily. Mm. And they uh, could also sometimes be low oxygen in the water during night. Mm. And then migrating fish will leave the area, but uh, more, most of the small animals in the sediment will have had some typical adaptions for it. You have these red mm. midgen larvae living in the, the sediments with the pigment which makes them able to take up low oxygen concentrations. Mm. So, and these bottoms, uh, would you call them accumulation bottoms yes. that we try to yes, that, refer that's back? A, yes, mm. that's a typical accumulation bottom. So, uh, what about uh, polluting substances? Do they accumulate here? Yes, uh, mm. since you have so much organic matter, mm. then uh, they are very strongly bound to the, mm. the organic sediment. And uh, metals are very, very strongly bound mm. to these accumulation bottoms. Mm -hmm. Heavy metals, heavy metals in, in especially. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, if we go, as you say, from the sandy bottoms, uh, where wind and wave activity dominates, uh, over to uh, uh, these muddy bottoms, how are they actually formed? Yeah, you can see uh, mm. uh, some of it in this short thing on the sea med of Sostra, just passing, and um, there uh, the plant community changes the bottom structure themselves. Mm -hmm. So by reducing the water movements, mm -hmm. they will, um, uh, how to say, they, they will accumulate more organic matter between the leaves. There are less water action and more organic matter is accumulated and in that way they will build up a more soft bottom mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. So the life forms are changing their own environment. Yes. Now there are a very dramatic example of that particular um, dynamics when the life forms form their own environment and this contribution is from Helsinki University again. Here on the northern Baltic coast where the land gradually rises from the sea thousands of islands are continuously born. In the process of the sea becoming land complex systems of open water sounds and coves will emerge and an extreme variety of habitats can be found. This is where we will also find the glows and the flats, which are shallow, isolated or almost isolated water bodies with a characteristic water plant vegetation and succession. On the leeward side of the islands, sand and mud will be deposited in shallow areas and in the sheltered bays reeds and communities of submerged water plants will establish themselves. 
The first stage of a flood is called a juvenile archipelago flood. Moving into this type of flood, one realizes that it still resembles the open archipelago. However, the formation of a flood becomes evident when studying its underwater topography. It is only a few meters deep with a submerged sill at its opening. In the juvenile flood, the reeds are expanding along the shores and water plant communities typical for floods will establish themselves. Here, the important carophyte Caratomentosa has invaded the most sheltered parts of the flood. We are now moving into an archipelago flood, which is connected with the sea by only a narrow opening. Inside the flood, the opening of the flood, we will meet the calm water surface of the sheltered flood. The shelter and the shallowness makes it possible for the water plants to thrive over the whole bottom of the flood. In the archipel archipelago flood, the Caratomentosa community expands and shallow and sheltered sites become invaded by a community of the water plant Nayas Marina. Other communities are forced to move towards the opening. This is now the only site where the vegetation of earlier stages is still discernible. Inside the shallow sill of an archipelago flood, the shelter, the accumulated organic sediments, the high water temperatures and other factors induce the birth of an extremely dense and rich vegetation. Thus, the competitive relationships between species will be very pronounced and therefore accelerates the succession of species and communities. Connected to this flood is a glow flood with no free contact with the sea. Here the sea water only passes slowly through the reeds in the former openings. Twenty years ago small motorboats could pass where it's today possible to walk. In the glow flood almost all shores are covered by reeds. The flood has become very shallow and Caratomentosa has taken over the whole flood bottom. In the landscape you can still differentiate the former openings. The vegetation of the glow flood is as yet very dense but after the glow flood has been completely isolated into a glow this succession of brackish water plants will cease and a succession of freshwater plants will start unless the glow has been completely overgrown before that. The floods are not only a botanically interesting stage in the process of the sea becoming land, but also have a wider ecological relevance, for example as spawning grounds for fish or as feeding grounds for birds. We will now go to even greater depth, well below where the plants are found, and then of course we only have animals. And these animals, uh, Lena, they are, are they growing on the... On, on the bottom or in the bottom? The main part of them are found uh, in the sediment. And uh, as you can see in this picture, very few are found on, on, on the surface. The most left one is uh, the dominant species in the community found in the Baltic, the Macoma Baltica. There is a quite interesting video from Kiel University that we'll see now. It has been shot mostly with the aid of an uh, unmanned camera. 
And in this one we will see several successive uh, shots from bottoms. The first one will be from the um, uh, southern end of the Öresund between Denmark and uh, Sweden. Yes, on this bottom is something like 30 meters depth and you can see brittle stars on the surface. They are of Eura species, but most, as I said before, most of the animals are hiding in the sediments. You can see some small holes now and then. There's a dead sea urchin, but a sea star, sorry. Uh, but that's not from this, this soft bottom. Mm -hmm. And here you can see uh, uh, lots of activity. It's activity. blowing around. Eh? Yes. And, uh, underwater these, storms, so what's going on? Yes, actually? that's underwater storms. Uh, the scientists are quite surprised that at this still rather shallow depths, there are lots of movements in the water just at the surface. Mm -hmm. And here you see a colony of a... Uh, a strange animal here. Very what strange you call it? animal. It's a leather coral. Leather, leather coral. coral. Leather coral. And what about now, uh, Nils? What is this? Oh, now we have moved all the way up to the Åland Sea. And it's quite deep also, 170 meters. It's Saduria. It's, it's a crustacean species you can see here. And... Uh, they are in fact quite large. Usually you would not, maybe not find life that deep because of the present oxygen situation in the Baltic, but here it seems very healthy bottom. And now we have another type again. This is in a corner basin. And these white uh, patches are uh, uh, bacteria. So there is no oxygen at all in these patches. And on the more brown parts there are, there are oxygen. And this is the camera leg digging through the sediment and you can see that's quite nicely laminated in different layers. So this is a sign that there are no animals digging around in this sediment, otherwise you wouldn't get this type of Lemon. black and, and brown and grey. But this is a totally dead bottom with... Um, no oxygen at all. Eh? No oxygen and this white cover of bacteria. Mm. The uh, black color here is are sulfides, uh, which uh, are formed when there are no oxygen, and the white color is bacterial mats, and the brown is mostly various type of iron oxides, rusty, we could say simply. Uh, well, this uh, rather funny animal, Nils Sadoria, I know you brought yes. something <laughs> with you again. I can show it to you. <laughs> You have, you have seen it, but uh, here you can see its size. It's uh, quite amazing. It's mm. quite large mm. animal. And uh, at present there is also research going on here at Stockholm University how this animal interacts with other animals in, in the bottoms. Who eats who and, and what role they have in structuring the communities. Mm. I know that the Finnish researchers are interested in this also. Yes. And, um, uh, this is one of the most ancient species in, in the Baltic, animal species in the Baltic. It's uh, a relict from the Ice Age, in fact. And a lot of research is going on in the different countries around the Baltic, including the Tvermine Zoological Station at uh, the Finnish Gulf. Mm -hmm. But it's found all the way up to the northern end, I think, yes. the Sadoria. Mm -hmm. Now, we are going to sum up all these various um, pictures of the various plant and animal communities by a few maps. And if you uh, uh, look at these maps, I think Lena will explain what's on them. Yes. This first map. This first map is showing the uh, algae communities. And that's made out from the surface down to something like 15 meters depth. The, so the red the, colors the around the coast. The red colors around the coast. These are not animal communities. And the animal communities we find on the deeper areas. So in the north we have Pontoporea and the Saduria. That's the red part up in the Botnian Bay. Then we have Mytilus along the shoreline more. Mm. That's the, the blue mussel. That's the blue, the blue mussel. Mm. And the typical Baltic mussel, Macoma, is on the deeper parts. And then the yellow thing around Gotland was the very, very impoverished part of the Area. With practically no life, yeah. yeah. These are biomass figures. Biomass figures with a high biomass in the southern part of the Baltic. And again, you can see quite nicely around Gotland, there's almost no animals living in these deeper areas with very low 
oxygen oh, content. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so that uh, will serve as a summary of the uh, survey of uh, the communities of the bottoms. And uh, we will now start rising up by, uh, with the aid of some music. And actually we have a small group of uh, choir singers here. They are from an Estonian choir called Cantus Est. And as some of you might know, there is quite a large population of Estonian origin in Sweden and Stockholm in particular. And uh, the Estonians like to sing and they did not stop their habit of singing when they came to Sweden. So we still have them here, please.
we say thank you very much to Cantus Est for these two Estonian songs. And Evald, uh, do you know this since before? Yeah, of mm. course. Mm -hmm. You yes, also I sing? Thanks no. for them, yes. Mm -hmm. It's very, very famous thing to Estonia, but especially the last one. Very good. Uh, we will continue with our main subject the, and go into ecology. Now we will talk about ecology and see what it actually is, as much as we can do in a few minutes. And uh, we will start by showing a first picture that um, explains um, some fundamental concepts. Yes, this is a, a picture of a simple food web. You have the primary producers, the algae, and also the very, very small algae, which uh, the small snail down at the cliff is grazing on. So you have some grazers, and there are some small crustaceans, which are feeding on the algae. And then you have, finally, they are cons also called consumers. And then uh, the second consumer is the fish. Yes, and so this is just a small community here. When we try to look at the little larger picture, Nils, what do we see? Yes, an, an ecosystem is much more than just the food webs and food chains and species. There are lots mm -hmm. of processes also. And uh, uh, this uh, diagram here shows a little bit the, the things that connect the different systems, the algal systems, the pelagic systems, and the benthic systems. And you can see sedimentation is one important uh, parameter here. It's like a rain down from the pelagic to the benthic systems. Of, and you can also see an algal drift, dead detached alga which go down to the, to the bottoms. And uh, down there they are remineralized and the nutrients are recycled up to the productive zone at the surface. Mm -hmm. I can guess that you have investigated this in some more detail. These are the principles, but what are the actual data? Did you try to find out? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. a, f a few years ago, we did some quite careful studies. And, and this sums a little bit what happens when the energy goes from one trophic level to the other. And uh, you can see the solar energy uh, which falls into the water, how it's distributed along the trophic levels, it's taken up by plants. It's only about less than 1% of the solar energy which is taken up by the ecosystem. And then it's transferred along uh, the food chains to the herbivores and the, the carnivores and the, and the fish. And uh, a considerable amount of the plant matter is also going to the bacteria as you can see. And once again I would like to point out the very important recycling of nutrients is those arrows that uh, go back to the plants. And uh, also, you may think that this is a waste to the ecosystem that it can't take care of all the sunlight which comes down. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, the, the remaining sun, the solar energy which comes down, that, that uh, is what produces the currents and, mm. and so on. And those are needed to transport the dead matter and the nutrients. And also, of course, a lot of it, most of it is lost to heat up the earth. Yes. So, uh, and not only us, of course, also everything else in the biosphere. Mm. So that's, um, so a small part is used for the biomass production. But we will look at one particular system now, that is the pelagic system. Pelagic means out in the open water. So we have the pelagic, we have the littoral, which is the coast, and we have the benthic, which is the bottom. But now it will look at the um, pelagic system in this small video. Oh. <laughs> we're asking for this. Mm. This uh, shows uh, the experiment we were doing because we enclosed the different communities in mm. plastic bags. Mm. And uh, by following changes in oxygen and nutrients and so mm. on in these, we could see which systems were productive and how much they produced and which were consumptive systems, which needed energy inputs from others. And it was quite clear that the algal system and the pelagic system, they are autotrophic and, and produce matter. But the benthic, the soft bottom systems, they need the input from the others to be able to function. Mm -hmm. So that was the experimental situation yes. you set up. 
to find out the results you just yes. explained. But now let's go back to the next video that will show the uh, pelagic system. Like in the hard bottom system, the pelagic zone down to something like 20 meters depth is uh, regarded as a producing system. And in this, the solar energy is synthesized and living organic matter is produced. The primary production in uh, the Baltic proper is around 150 grams carbon per square meter and year. And when you go further north into the Baltic Sea up to the Gulf of Botnia, it decreases in the similar way as also primary production in hard bottoms and soft bottoms decreases. The spring bloom in the northern Baltic proper starts in late February or early March. With increasing light and abundant nutrients, phytoplankton biomasses are rapidly built up, mainly by the dinoflagellate Goniolax catenata and the diatoms Thalassocera baltica and Skeletonema costatum. The fixation of solar energy is intense, reaching values of 1.5 gram carbon per square meter a day. The rapid sinking of diatoms in combination with the absence of large herbivores means that as much as 40% of the organic matter synthesized during the spring bloom sinks out of the pelagic zone and settles on the soft bottom below. In fact, this constitutes to as much as half of the annual requirement of food of the soft bottom systems. The water is now exhausted of nutrients and low biomasses of both phytoplankton and zooplankton persist for a time. Towards summer, production increases again, maintained by small forms of dinoflagellates and monads. Now larger zooplankton forms become common in the open sea, mainly Temora longicornis and Pseudocalanus minutus elongatus. In July-August, a conspicuous bloom of blue-green algae, especially Nodularia spumigena, dominates the pelagic zone. This nitrogen-fixing freshwater algae produces gas vacuoles and sometimes large quantities float to the surface, where winds and currents arrange the algae thread bundles in dense patches. Calculations from satellite pictures and ground measurements have suggested the nitrogen fixing ability to be in the same order of magnitude as the land-based input of nitrogen to the Baltic. The decline of the blue-green bloom releases nutrients, especially nitrogen, to the water and initiates an autumn bloom of dinoflagellates, green algae and diatoms. The large zooplankton forms are now at their maximum and pelagic fish like herring and sprat graze heavily, storing up fat reserves for the winter. Winter time with low solar radiation is dominated by decomposition processes. Herring is forced to feed at the bottom on amphipods, mycids and polychaetes, where they stay until spawning in May. At least in the northwestern part of the Baltic proper, the herring preferentially deposit their row on filamentous brown algae like Pilayella. A couple of weeks old, the fry return to the open waters. The herring thus utilizes all three subsystems during the year, acting as a transport mechanism of matter between them. The pelagic zone in the summer, the soft bottom in winter, and the seaweed system in the spring. Now, um, you mentioned uh, plankton several times there. Apparently yes. this is very basic to the pelagic system. What is actually plankton? A plankton is a sm could be small mainly, plant or animal who are not able to swim against the current. So if you have a strong current uh, that the definition is it's free floating it and it can't move directly where it wants to go. Mm. So if you have a jellyfish for example, it's a mm. rather big thing, then 
they are still called plankton. Oh, that's impressive, plankton, I must <laughs> yes. say. I guess most of them are rather microscopic. Yes, most of them. Mm -hmm. And especially the phytoplanktons, the, uh, those able to photosynthesize. And they are at the basic, of course, of the production of the pelagic system. I believe we have a map here which will uh, show some of that. Yes. This. And again, as we have said several times now, I think, is that in the southern part you have the highest production, also in the pelagic system, as in on the rocky shores mm -hmm. and on the soft bottoms. And as you go north, you have less and less primary production. So it's ju just one tenth in the Botnian Bay compared to the southern part of the Baltic, mm -hmm. where you have 150 grams carbon per square meter and year. Mm -hmm. So, so this it's map quite drastic mm. change when you go north. Mm. And this uh, sort of summarizes the ecological situation for the Baltic Sea there. Yes. So with this uh, summary, we will, we will go over to some student questions. And uh, we will start, as we did last time, by a student that's with us here. We have several of the students following the course at Stockholm University that are here. And uh, one of them, I believe, have... Uh, uh, prepared a question for us, please. Yeah, I would like to ask why such a big difference uh, from year to year in the early bloom. Like this year was a big early bloom in the Baltic Sea, but last year it wasn't. How come this is? Well, it's true that this year there was uh, quite enormous algal bloom in August, east of Gotland. And uh, I don't know what you say, Lena. Is this uh, typical or atypical? It's totally really depending on the weather. Uh, I think mm -hmm. there, there are always uh, large blooms around, mm -hmm. but if you have a special type of calm weather, you have warm water and mm -hmm. then uh, all these things will float onto the surface. But if mm -hmm. you have it very turbid uh, and lots of waves going on, then uh, they will be m evenly distributed in the mm -hmm. water. So we will not see them. So uh, there is a problem that you would say that the eutrophication perhaps is not that's not, no algae bloom, everything is good. Mm. And mm. algae bloom, everything is bad. Mm. But um, probably they're there all the time. Mm. What about the Estonian attitude here? Do you have algal blooms in Estonian waters too? Uh, yes, we have regularly had algal blooms and we hope that we will proceed that line mm. <laughs> in the future too. <laughs> mm. And what do the Estonian public say about that? Do they get upset as in Sweden? or? Well, I don't think so, because of that is a normal, normal mm. thing and normal biological process. Mm. Yes, well, let's go over to a new question, and I believe we have two uh, telephone connections. Well, what about uh, Gävle Sandviken? Are you there? Yes. Hello, and yes, this, this is? University College in Gävle Sandvik. Yeah, welcome to the Baltic University. This is a small, um, one of the smaller groups, I believe. How many are you there? We are 16 people tonight. Mm. One of them want to ask a question. Well, please go ahead. Yeah, my question to you is uh, how sensitive is the flora and fauna in the Baltic Sea if the salinity is decreasing? due to the construction of a bridge over Öresund. Well, that was a very clear question. What will happen if salinity decreases due to the destruction of the bridge, yeah. which of course is not uh, absolutely certain will be the result of the construction. But uh, Nils, do you have a comment to that question? Uh, well, I think uh, what will happen or what we fear if the bridge is constructed is uh, that there will be less inflow of saline uh, water from the North Sea mm -hmm. and uh, uh, probably this will not affect directly the species living in the surface water mm -hmm. because uh, uh, they can still tolerate salinity variations and the mm -hmm. salinity will not change very much in the surface water mm -hmm. but it will be catastrophic probably for the for the deep bottoms mm -hmm. because if this uh, inflow of saline water is inhibited, we will not get any oxygen down to the bottoms, deep mm -hmm. bottoms, and we, the hydrogen sulfide situation may be much worse than it is mm -hmm. today. So it's actually the oxygen situation rather than the salinity situation that is marginally very sensitive. Yes, I mm -hmm. would say so. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, as we discussed last time, it's very difficult to say anything of the consequences of this particular plans with the bridge from a scientific point of view. We just do not have data that is um, good enough to make good judgment. Uh, we will try to uh, see if there is one more um, telephone connection to Murzynova in Poland. Hello. Hello, Dzień dobry. Is this? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Vitek. Very good. How are you doing down there? We have quite, quite good connection. Very nice. How many are you? When, as I present you, one, one of my students, we have about 40 students. Thank nice. I will explain to those seeing this that this is a, the field station of the Department of Geography at Warsaw University. And there, there are 40 students. Is there one student who wants to ask this question? Okay, okay, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Please. Please go ahead. Well, th this was quite difficult to hear. This is, illustrates one of the main problems with the Baltic University, communication. <laughs> but uh, I think that the question had to do with the protection of the mammals and the birds in the Baltic. Are there any agreements, uh, international agreements, uh, or measures taken to protect the large mammals, that is the seeds? and perhaps the birds in the Baltic. Now we have uh, Mats Olsson, who is a professor at the Swedish uh, Museum of Natural History with us here in the audience. And Mats, would you be able to uh, comment on this student's question from Poland, please? Yes, first I think I want to tell you that there are three species of seals in the Baltic. And depending on what species we are discussing, there are different rules. First of all, we have gray seal, which is covering in the entire Baltic. And then we have ringed seal in the very north and in the eastern part of the Baltic. And finally, common seal in uh, the very south of the Baltic. And um, there are different uh, attempts to protect them. First of all, we have to look at what reason there are to the decrease of the populations. This is hunting, pollution, and uh, these two reasons are uh, the severe reasons why they have dec decreased. So first of all, there are protected areas where the seals can hold out and be protected from disturbances. In Sweden, we have about 21 protected areas. In the uh, Soviet Union, three protected areas. And in Estonia, two protected areas. Another step is to protect them from hunting. So since 1988, all three species are in all the Baltic totally protected from hunting. And finally, one step is to protect the Baltic from the pollutants which have created the problems for the seals. And that is the persistent organic chlorines which have uh, made them unhealthy. And uh, the HELCOM, Helsinki Commission, has uh, special uh, questions around how to protect the Baltics from the pollution. Thank you, Mats. What about the student in Murzynova? Are you still there? Hello. Well, it looks like the connection is gone. I hope uh, he or she here or there was uh, um, content with the answer. Thank you, Mats. So we had, we should also say that this Gävle Sandviken is a small city college just north of uh, Uppsala, Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, now we will take the occasion and go on with the next video that shows exactly the seals, which are one of the top predators in the Baltic ecosystem. It's uh, a, um, a video that uh, shows the life of the grey seals. Grey seals in the Gulf of Bothnia on a summer morning. 
Gray seals resemble man in many ways. Besides being large predators, they are also sociable animals. They are quite happy to lie next to each other while they rub off their old winter coat. The appearance of the gray seal is very distinct. Their long noses making them easy to recognize. This probably gave them their Latin name, Helicurus gripus. Helicurus meaning sea pig. Their long noses can be thought to resemble a pig's snout. Seals have been present in the Gulf of Bothnia for many thousands of years. They have always been important game for hunters. For many years, seal hunting was the main sustenance for the people living on the Baltic coast. In early summer, seals gather on their favorite rocks. Gray seals, unlike the smaller ring seal, are sociable animals. They like to crowd together on low rocks furthest out from land. This is also the time for shedding their winter fur. They spend many hours basking in the morning sun, drying out their coats. Most of the places where seals gather are restricted areas, access being only available to researchers. The seal was once a land animal, but over the millennia they have adapted well to life in the sea. The grey seal can dive to a depth of over a hundred meters and can stay underwater for more than 20 minutes on a single breath. To be able to do this, the seal is able to reduce its oxygen demand by diving. In late February, the seal cubs are born on the ice. This separates the grey seals of the Baltic from those of the North Sea, whose cubs are born in autumn on the coastal rocks. In the beginning, the seal cubs are totally dependent upon their mothers. Their thick, fine white coats are made for keeping them warm in the cold winter air and not for swimming. They rely totally on their mother's rich milk. Seal milk has a 50% fat content and within three weeks of birth, the cubs increase their weight from 10 to 60 kilos. This gives them a mean weight increase of two kilos per day. The seal's layer of blubber is vitally important. After the cubs have stopped feeding from their mothers and lose their white fur, it's time for them to be on their own and to start catching their own fish. Oh. 
Less than a month after birth, the moment has come for the young seal to enter its new environment. For the parents, the new mating season has started. Grey seals can live for between 30 and 40 years. This should give them a high survival potential. However, even though hunting has largely stopped, the existence of this large grateful predator in the Baltic is now seriously threatened by modern pollution. I think there is one thing more to add about the seals, and that is the conflict between fishermen and seals. And in all countries where we have seals, we also have a conflict with uh, the fishermen. Um, this conflict is natural because of the destruction which the seals create on fishing equipments. But what is often forgotten is that uh, there is uh, a threat, the, the fishing activity is a threat for the population of seals since uh, there is a large proportion of the young pups or young seals which annually are produced are trapped in fishing gears and killed. We call it bycatches. And uh, as much as about 10 to 25 percent of the total number of grey seal pups produced per year is uh, caught in fishing net and drowned. So this is something which the international authorities are concerned about today and uh, there are steps within the Helcom or Helsinki Commission to at least get an assumption of how large this bycatch is all over the Baltic and uh, by this figures it can be it is possible to, to get uh, measurement of the Conf the, the, uh, um, uh, the importance of the fishing activity for the survival of the seals. We will go over to one of the other top predators of the Baltic ecosystems and we'll do this by watching uh, the situation at the uh, bird cliffs. The bird cliffs in the Baltic Sea are found at the a particular at the two islands west of Gotland. These are called the small and the large Karlsö Islands. The birds you see here are guimot. It's one of three different species of orcs that live here. The guimot is the most important of them. Uh, they are also specialized uh, fish eaters. This particular one has a herring in the mouth, but they not only eat herring, they also uh, hunt uh, tobis, a small fish in these waters. Um, they fish, it said, something like five or six uh, five or six tons of fish daily. Um, now, of course, the, um, the pollution status of the, um, of the Baltic is such that these herrings contain some pollutants and it is being accumulated in the guillemot birds and it also is found in the eggs. So the eggs of these birds are one of the uh, um, possibilities to examine the pollution status of the sea. You can see here that the birds uh, put their eggs uh, just on the rock itself. Now they eat the, they, they eat the uh, fish and all the um, the nutrients are recirculated, of course, because it comes back. This is a quite dramatic and unusual environment because uh, the bird cliffs are typical for, for the coast of the oceans. It's, it's not at all typical for a brackish water um, environment. But we do have them on a few places. It's uh, west of Gotland. It's uh, on the uh, Estonian coast. There is a small colony. And there is also in southern Baltic southern Baltic a few small colonies. This is a large gull and the gulls are also sometimes predating on the on the orcs. Here this particular um, um, black-headed black-backed gull is eating a small young uh, orc, a guillemot. 
So that is the law of nature, so to speak. Uh, we should also say that there are some 20,000 individuals, individual birds on these bird cliffs west of Gotland, and um, um, about five or 6,000 pairs that breed there. Just as there are some very particular and peculiar birds and mammals, there are also some quite unusual fish species. And we will now, in a, in a contribution from Vilnius University in Lithuania, see some, uh, some such uh, fish species. And this particular one is the sturgeon. Um, I believe it's something that we will discuss with you about when we have seen this. Is uh, how many species of fish do you have in these waters? Uh, well, uh, that uh, that means sturgeon. About no. Sturgeon. Well, in general, in the uh, on the uh, in the Baltic. Now we are, oh, no, we are uh, on the picture actually. It's land in Lithuania. It's we'll only 99 kilometers. Just 1.5 percent of total shoreline. Although this is a very small part of the Baltic Sea, but rather specific. For the best expression of its specificity, I shall tell you about fishes. In general, carp fishes prevail in the Kronin Lagoon. I would mention roach, red eye, silver bream, tench and bream. freshwater fish in Lithuania is a sheet fish. Largest specimens are met in the lakes, water reservoirs and of course in the Namanas River. The largest fish in Lithuania was the common sturgeon, Asipenser sturio. In this photo there is one of them caught in 1929 in the Namnas river at Kaunas. Title Lithuanian Fishes, published in 1986. All fishes met in Lithuania are enlisted, including common sturgeon. But in fact, over five decades, Lithuanian fishermen did not see it. The Marine Museum Aquarium in Klaipeda has no sturgeon. They have only its relatives, beluga, Russian sturgeon, and sterlet as well as the bester, a hybrid of beluga and Russian sturgeon. Well, Eval, did you ever see the sturgeon? Uh, yes, that mm. was about 25 years ago. I uh, really saw a wild Asipenser sturia that was caught in the Gulf of Riga by fishermen. Mm -hmm. But that was the last time I saw this fish and I haven't uh, heard that anybody has seen uh, it later on. Do you, what do you think are the reasons for the uh extinction of the sturgeon from uh, Estonia and perhaps the Baltic in general? Yes, it seems that that species has been exterminated by, by man. And that is a very serious question, of course. I think that uh, here, both uh, 
overexploitation, very serious overexploitation and pollution and construction dams has, uh, have had their parts. Uh, that is a very large fish and therefore it, it was caught very intensely both uh, before the first spawning and after that. That meant that uh, the fish was maybe already caught off uh, the sea before the first spawning. And that was the main cause for overexploitation of that fish. And the last blow was, of course, uh, pollution. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, that particular fish is gone now. But of course we have a lot uh, other fishes. And uh, fishing is an extremely important activity, as we said, uh, for men around the Baltic Sea. It has been uh, uh, the basis for the food also in Sweden, at least, and perhaps several other countries um, many, many years ago. And still it's very important. We will uh, show a short video that sort of summarizes the situation for the fishing in the Baltic. Fishing in the Baltic Sea is age-old. Herring, spread and cod, but also species like flounder, salmon and eel have been fished since centuries. By traditional fishing methods, the catches were limited. Still around 50,000 tons of fish was landed yearly in the beginning of the century. The fish has been and is an important source of food for the populations on the shore of the Baltic. In fact, it accounted recently for close to 10% of the protein intake in Finland and Sweden. Today's fishing methods are quite efficient. The larger boats have, have a crew of several men. A week or more is spent on the sea at a time. Since the 1970s, each country is allotted a fishing zone close to its coast by international agreement. This Swedish ship comes from Karlskrona in southern Sweden and fish east of Blekinge. There are quite a few fishing vessels in the neighborhood of the boat. Every dot on the radar screen indicates a vessel. Within a radius of 40 kilometers, about 35 ships are located. The ship is equipped with computers for navigation and for keeping track of previous fishing results. The fish is located by echo or sonar techniques. The green indications on the screen are fish schools. The most important fishing gears are the trawls. Trawls of different kinds exist. There are pelagic trawls that catch at a determined depth. There are trawls that stay at the surface and there are bottom trawls. This is a bottom trawl. It is let down to the bottom and pulled by the boat. The trawl is dragging on the bottom. The speed is about 7 kilometers per hour. It is kept open by a plow-like st steel gadget. At the bottom, mostly cod and flounder is found. The fish, scared by the noise and resuspended bottom sediment, swim in front of the trawl. Although they would be able to swim away, they continue in the front. After about 30 minutes, they get tired. They end up at the back of the trawl. The trawling lasts for about three hours. The fish catch this time was mostly cod. The cod catches in the Baltic were at its maximum in 1984, with 400,000 tons landed. Today it is less than half. The situation of the spread is even more alarming. 160,000 tons was landed in the early 1970s, and this figure declined to about 30,000 in the mid-80s. It has since decreased to some degree. The fish is taken care of directly on the ship and put on ice or frozen.
The larger fishes are cleaned manually. The liver, although a valuable food, is thrown away because of its high content of industrial pollutants. The fishing of today is extremely efficient. The result for this boat was 420 boxes for three days of fishing. It would easily be possible to overfish the Baltic Sea unless there were restrictions. But national fishing quotients have been agreed. Um, now we have seen that cod and spread populations has decreased and changed dramatically. But what about the herring population, Evald? Yes, uh, the Baltic Sea is the only place in the world ocean where herring population has not been severely depleted at all. That is uh, mainly due to the fact that Baltic herring population has a mosaic structure. That is, uh, it consists of many populations that haven't been depleted simultaneously. And the Baltic Sea is uh, quite a uh, a productive sea at present. So when one population is decreasing, the other will increase and so on? Yes, so that is a system. Yeah. So what would you say about the total biomass of herring in the Baltic Sea? The total biomass is about 1.5 million tons now and uh, the catches are about uh, 400,000 tons, so we annual catches. So we catch 25% uh, of the production then? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, that's normal I think. Would you say that uh, there is a correlation between the various populations? You have the cods and you have the herring, for example. Yes, mm. I think so. It's, mm. it's not only man who takes herring and, and spread out of the Baltic, but uh, also the cod. Mm. And it's a quite heavy predator. And I think if you have a lot of cod in the Baltic, there have been estimates they take about the same amount as man of, of herring and, and, and spread. So, mm. so they cycle. What about spread then? Is that uh, on a low level now or is it? Well, spread was in a low level. Uh, at the beginning of 80s, uh, the catches were only about 30,000 tons per year, but now uh, they have increased about 100,000 tons annual catch. Mm -hmm. And spread is, uh, spread is very uh, much fluctuating uh, stock in the Baltic as well. And uh, it's very curious that if we have uh, good codfish stock, then we don't have spread and vice versa, mm -hmm. because of cod, uh, cod eats spread. So that's again a yeah. relationship between yeah. the populations. Well, we, uh, we leave these uh, aspects of the fishing and continue uh, with another aspect of um, the life of the Baltic, that is the migration. There are birds migrating, there are fishes migrating, as we have heard, and there are mammals migrating. But let's look at the birds migrating on this uh, contribution from St. Petersburg University. Hi, I am Rustam Sagitov from Leningrad University. The topic of our small presentation is protection of migratory birds in Baltic basin. Annual cycle of birds, as in many other vertebrates, consist of successive and correlated stages, such as breeding, growth and development of young, molting, hibernation. But unlike in other living organisms, those seasonal phenomena in birds usually proceed in different areas. By means of migration, stages of annual cycle may be separated in space and timed to the regions with optimal foraging conditions. Success of the whole annual cycle depends on prosperity of each stage. In this case, migrating period proved to be most vulnerable because natural environmental complexes along flyways in Europe practically strongly destroyed and destruction is still going on. Migrating activity may last more than half a year, so some species spending many months in danger. The most common way of studying migrations is ringing of birds. Ornithologists of Leningrad University are using several kinds of traps for that purposes. 
every year we are ringing approximately 20,000 20, birds. Ring recoveries of young starlings marked near Leningrad shows that starting independent life in June, July, they are flying west and molting in Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. In October, November, they are moving to Holland, Denmark, Belgium, where spending winter. In March, April, they are returning back to the coast of Gulf of Finland. Most numerous accumulations of migrating birds are appearing along the coastlines of large water reservoirs. In northern part of European subcontinent, main migrating ways are connected with so-called White Sea Baltic Flyway, ecologically attractive landscapes, coasts and wetlands of Baltic Basin. The majority of the 340 or so species of birds in the Baltic region are migratory. So uh, bird migration is a very pronounced phenomenon here. We have all seen it, I'm, I'm sure. We will now continue with migrating fishes. And of course, the, uh, the uh, prime example of that is the salmon. And we will see how salmon is behaving in this contribution that is based on uh, pictures from Stetson University in the beginning and Åland uh, later on. The salmon spends part of its life in fresh water. In this environment, they will spawn and grow. But after a few years, the young salmon migrate to the sea where they spend most of their adult life. When they are mature, adult salmon will return to the rivers to spawn. But it is not any river, as adult salmon always return to the same river they were born in. As far as known, very little genetic exchange occurs between salmon populations from different rivers. Each river has developed a local variety with its specific adaptations to the environment. Salmon is a very popular fish for consumption and there is an intensive fishery for them in the Baltic. Their birth rivers are also used by man. Dams and harbour constructions along the rivers now obstruct the migration of salmon to their spawning grounds. To counter this decrease in the salmon stock, artificially raised fry have been released into the Baltic for many years. This has ensured the continuation of the Baltic salmon fishery. But what have been the effects upon the natural salmon population? To produce artificially raised fry, only a few pairs of breeding adults are used, compared to the many thousands of naturally breeding pairs. This has resulted in a genetic impoverishment of the local Baltic salmon population. The salmon population of the Baltic has now lost much of its natural genetic variation. Today, only a small number of salmon are still able to spawn naturally. As you can see in this diagram, most of the salmon living in the Baltic today are produced artificially. Similar problems exist at fish farms when fish escape and mix with the natural wild population. In fish cages, with their unnaturally high densities, the risk of disease is increased. These diseases are in turn easily spread to the wild salmon population. Fish farming is today an important industry in the Baltic, together with the natural fishery. So the question will be, not should we cultivate fish, but rather, how can we decrease the negative effects? Now, uh, of course, uh, the river you saw there with the salmon was Odra River in Poland, but uh, most salmon rivers are up in the north of the Baltic. Um, the fish farming is starting to become an important activity. Paula, you have some figures about that. Yes, in the Oland archipelago that we just had on the screen, there are about uh, 35 fish farms and the annual production of rainbow trout, which is here, is about uh, 6 million kilos. Uh, total production in the Baltic of the rainbow trout is about 50 million kilos 
And these numbers can be compared to the Norwegian salmon production, which is about 150 million kilos. Mm. So that's the world record, mm. I understand, Norwegian yes, part. Yes, yes. But we come on a very top position in the Baltic too. Mm. Uh, what do you think are the effects of the fish farming, as you know from your experience on Åland? You see the, the back drawbacks with it. Yes, there are of course these risks with these fish diseases that can spread into the farms, but also from farms outside mm. to the wild stock. And mm. then there are these environmental impacts that can be shown. Mm. You mean eutrophication perhaps yes. in the first place? Mostly, yes. Now, Lena, what is your comment on the fish farming? Yes, it's uh, a problem with if you have a, almost a monoculture of genetically very closely related individuals in, in the fish farm and they get loose. Of mm -hmm. course, they mix into the natural population and in that way you can change the genetic of the salmon population in the Baltic and that has partly been done already. It has been done already, we know that. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, Nils, do you want to comment on this fish farming from an um, ecological point of view? Yes, I, I think the, the mm. effects of fish farming are not only restricted to the local impacts, but you should mm. look at fish farming in a very large context. Mm. And uh, that is because you need resources for it. You need to make the fish meal which you feed the fish by, and that means you have to catch a lot of fish somewhere else. Mm. And uh, of course, if you catch too much fish there, then, then the fish stocks will be depleted that mm. could give reductions in, in bird populations and seals may change or something. Mm. Mm. So uh, I think it's important to look at the whole Baltic ecosystem that, that should be the total sort of drainage basin of the Baltic. That is the ecosystem we will deal with. Mm. Well, I think that was a very good final comment. We have to regard the Baltic region as a one ecosystem and go on with that. Thank you all who has come here. Nils Kautsky, Lena Kautsky, Evad Ojaver from Tallinn and Paula Lindros from Turku Obo. Thank you very much. Now I believe that um, we will have a short introduction to the next session. Yeah, next time, two weeks from now, we will discuss eutrophication. This means uh, the consequences for the aquatic ecosystem of input, so too much of the central plant nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Next time, eutrophication of the Baltic Sea.